You are listening to Middle East Monitor Conversations, bringing you lively discussions with prominent voices from the region and beyond as we delve deeper into issues shaping the Middle East and North Africa, from politics to culture and the arts. Hello, welcome to Member Conversation. I'm Osman Butt. It is the 31st of January 2024, and with the war in Gaza about to enter its fourth month, which has so far left over 26,000 Palestinians and up to 222 Israeli soldiers dead, over 130 Israeli hostages are still being held in Gaza, and up to 1.8 million Gazans have been displaced or driven from their homes. We hear of ceasefire talks going on in Paris, but it's not entirely clear how they are going. Meanwhile, fighting is obviously continuing. These developments force us to ask, where are we heading? Helping us to make sense of this, all of this, is Daniel Levy. Daniel Levy is the president of the US Middle East Project, which works and strives to advance a dignified Israeli-Palestinian peace to end occupation, discrimination and refugeehood in which international legality is upheld, equality and mutual security respecting the rights of all people. From 2012 to 2016, Levy was director of uh, for the Middle East and North Africa at the European Council of Foreign Relations. Prior to that, he was a senior fellow at the director of the New America Foundation Middle East Task Force in Washington, D.C. Levy was a senior advisor in the Israeli Prime Minister's office and to Justice Minister Yossi Balin during the government of Ehud Barak. He was a member of the official Israeli delegation to the Israel-Palestine peace talks at Taba and Barak and also at Oslo B under Yitzhak Rabin. Levy was born and educated in the UK, where he has returned to residing and where he graduated with an MA and BA in King's College, Cambridge, with awards. He testified before the UN Security Council three times during 2020 to 2022, and his most recent UN Security Council briefing can be viewed on YouTube. Daniel, welcome to Memo Conversations. Thank you, Asma. So, and it is our pleasure to have you. Um, I've been looking forward to this talk quite a bit, um, but I wonder if you can sort of, um, where we can start is, you know, as I've mentioned in the opening, we have, you know, ongoing fighting happening in Gaza, bombardments, we have, you know, hostages still at large, we have possible peace talks happening. How would you describe the public mood in Israel at this time? An interesting place to start. The Israeli public mood, I think we have to acknowledge up front, is not unidirectional. It, it, it would be surprising, in fact, if there weren't countervailing trends and a lot of cognitive dissonance going on there, right? What I think people will have been exposed to, in particular, is this post-October 7th outburst of really quite horrendous, vengeful, uh, dehumanizing uh, talk and action, it's not just talk, of course, uh, towards the, the Palestinians after what was a real shock to the Israeli system. The events were shocking. The, 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 the right to resist the right to self-defense under occupation does not extend to killing civilians. There will almost certainly be investigations that show there were violations of international law uh, on October 7th. But the Israeli reaction, the mobilization around not just a military response, but a response which has been so devastating to the Palestinian population, so indiscriminate, uh, in its targeting and its impact on ordinary people, whether it's the killings that you mentioned, 10,000 plus children, three times. I mean, I remember early on, you might too, us, man, when Save the Children put out that factoid and that graphic that we were in the 3,000 plus children killed at that stage. And it was, uh, this, is, this is now more than the average number of children killed Every any year in the last several years across conflicts around the world, 
I mean, can we believe that it's now three times that? So, Israeli public mood. Uh, you have this, this real dehumanization. Now, at the same time, you also have, I think, a shock to the system. What's going on? We thought we had the Palestinian issue managed. Now, at the deep state, if I can call it that, and at the leadership military establishment level, I think that that hubris, that sense of, ah, you know, the Palestinians, yeah, the you know, Hamas is a problem, but we, we've got this, we've got the world, we've got more and more of the region on our side with normalization. This is really going quite swimmingly. We've managed to incorporate the, the open ethnic cleansers, eradicationists, the guys who don't it, kind of shuffle in their seats and then counter accuse when they're told it's apartheid, the guys who say out and proud, yes, racism, Ben Gavir and Smotrich, those have been incorporated into the Israeli government with almost no impact on Israel's international standing. Let's go back pre-October 7th. Under this Israeli government, the United Kingdom, government puts out a roadmap for UK-Israel bilateral relations through to 2030, in which the Palestinian issue is totally marginalized. Just Let's just make this bilateral relationship even more fabulous. The United States, just immediately in the lead up, is not only working to further advance normalization, but it gives Israel something that Israeli governments have worked on for decades, which is the entry into the visa waiver program. It may sound really technical to people, but it's a huge gift to the Israelis. This is under this government. So Israel is deep in this, maybe we should call it pa Palestinian denialism um, phase. The sense we can get away with anything, that question can be parked. It's yesterday's story and boom. And so I think there's, there's deep discombobulation in, especially amongst the public. And if I were to add one other thing, I, I think the Israelis are, in different ways, trying to adapt to how they process this. So for some, and it's 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 it, and this is where you begin to get tensions and fissures and fault lines on the Israeli side. Yes, you, you see significant public support. Uh, for the operation, but the tensions and the cracks appear because for some, this is almost a moment to celebrate. And we've seen some like r r r IDF military rabbis, you know, some of these images of people dancing in, 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 and almost celebrating, we're going to take back Gaza, we're going to remove all the Palestinians. This is the moment to achieve the maximalist goals. For others, this is not even the IDF can protect me. What is going on here now? The ability to take that thought to a place which says, oh, I'm never going to have security if we're oppressing these people, am I? I think it's somewhere in the back of people's minds, not necessarily at the forefront, not at the forefront. Um, but there's this, there's this sense of a slow recognition of an unraveling, a decomposition in a system which people thought was sustainable and which isn't. And maybe we'll touch on this in a moment. What I've described there is the dynamics amongst the Israeli Jewish population. Because of course, there's a whole nother reality for the 20% of Israelis who are Palestinian citizens of Israel, often forgotten. And I think for many of them, this has been a moment where even those who they saw as their allies on the Israeli Jewish side have suddenly gone woo off the deep end. And this is a community that feels uh, deeply traumatized in its way because it feels that even the, the protection under discrimination, which they had um, in Israel, uh, is fraying at the edges, especially with the giving out of, of weapons, uh, the people being arrested for social media posts, which are, are, are incredibly, um, you know, motherhood and apple pie uh, type posts. So 
so that's another aspect of the reality. Yes, and it's uh, it's interesting what you describe there because there's this thing that you know we, those of us outside have been looking at when we look at Israel Palestine from afar is we sort of see especially since October seventh a kind of coming out of something that we've always seen which is this kind of dual reality where on the one hand there's a sense that Israel feels you know feels very emboldened and can do what it wishes as you've described. But there's another thing coupled with that, which is on the one hand, we have impunity, but on the other hand, we're completely vulnerable. Um, and these two sort of things seem to exist, coexist together, and they sort of come out. And I think since October 7th, that's come out very sharply, much more widely. But for those of us who have been following this for a long time, this is two elements we've always seen. It's just more pronounced now. So could you perhaps tell us a little bit about this dynamic? Yes. I mean, you you see that the that the, the, these things coexist there's there's a phrase um in in yiddish actually uh, people may know the biblical story of, of samson uh holds up the pillars strong man uh, and it's that shimshon de nebertika is the phrase samson the the weak feeble like someone one would take pity on and i think sometimes israel at one and the same time is we're, we're super powerful, nuclear armed state, uh, most powerful military in the region, high tech economy, remarkable weapon sales, surveillance technology leader, bought Israel a lot of friends around the world, a lot of enemies as well in civil society, but amongst regimes and leaderships. Um, and and yet at the same time, we're always on the precipice of another Holocaust. And, and the need to constantly just check, okay, everyone's with us? Yeah, everyone's with us. This whole attempt to instrumentalize anti-Semitism and deploy it. Now, I think partly that is the real lived experience of Jewish history. I think partly that is the necessity in Israeli state ideology, in actual existing Zionism, if you like, to permanently re-traumatize because that is so central to it. If the question is, why can't Jews ever live safely? Then the answer is Israel. Or not, why can't? If, if the statement is Jews can never live safely in the world, then the answer is Israel. Rather than if the question is, how, how are we part of an end to genocidal racism, discrimination, etc. Now, I think what you've seen is this, 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 this in a way, trivialization of the Holocaust around these claims that, that, that this is what, what October 7th was. And this, this outpouring of the constant attempt to, I would argue, exaggerate the precariousness of Jewish existence. It also means you look at Jewish history in a different way, because you look at Jewish history through the lens, not of thriving, flourishing, vibrant communities who achieved remarkable things across so many places in the world, but it's communities always on the edge of disaster. It of course means that you write out of that history, the fact that the, the pre most of the prejudice and suffering that Jewish communities faced were in white Christian Europe, not in the Middle East among Muslim communities. So you, you write out that history, which is a very different history, which is so counter intuitive, so antithetical to the message of the state ideology. So that's that's the dynamic is, is Israel's living with. The, the impunity, I think, is being challenged in new ways. <clears throat> uh, though that is really important. <clears throat> but what it also means, I think, as, as Israeli society, on the one hand, you see the, these 
very extreme manifestations of of a, a an exterminationist fundamentalism without which you couldn't have had both the destruction in Gaza and the indifference to the destruction. And, and alongside that, some people saying, okay, that that isn't something I can align with. And also some people inside at least con conscious of the fact that this is unlikely to end well. I think there's a real question, what do you do with that? And, and I, I, I just want to put out the following thought, which is Israeli Jewish society will also need to be offered a landing place that is different to a state ideology which cannot offer equality to Palestinians. Israeli Jewish society will have to be offered a place where it has a future in that region. Now, I'm not suggesting that in the midst of the horrors that are happening in Gaza, this is the time for a great Palestinian initiative to say, you know, here's how you're not only going to be tolerated here, but you're part and parcel of the future here. Because this, if, if we are thinking about the lens of settler colonialism, and if this is not Algeria, where the settler colonialists are forcibly kicked out. If we are, if if we recognise that there's a permanence to this Israeli Jewish presence, and we want to avoid the lurch even more to the extreme, because there's Rwanda-style genocidal talk going on on the Israeli side, then we have to eventually carve out this future space. And I think the ANC did that really smartly in South Africa where you are part of the future nation we, nation we envisage. And actually, this is how you will achieve your real security, because you will never be secure. And deep down, you will know you will never be secure in a reality where you keep us oppressed, where Palestinians are not going to see dignity, rights, and equality. And yeah, that's a lot to wrap one's head around. It is, It's uh, but it's also a vision a lot of people have been talking about for some time that... Uh -huh. We need to have a vision of society which is not based on any kind of communal supremacism. It has to be equality and everyone should have a place. Um, of course, you know, these voices sort of get pushed out of even, let's say, here in the West and mainstream media, you get pushed out because, you know, you're questioning Israel's right to exist um, and that kind of thing. But I do sort of, as we were talking, I do wonder about how aware the Israeli public are of the scale of destruction in Gaza and what's happening. Because from what I can see, you've got, I mean, if you're like an 18 year old kid with TikTok, you're seeing Israeli soldiers post all of this stuff where they're standing in front of bombed out buildings, going through women's underwear or whatever it is they do. So you have some awareness of what's actually happening. But if you're an older person and you're watching the news, my impression is, and this is also what I've seen reported, you're not really being shown images from Gaza of this just the level of destruction. And I sort of wonder, because sometimes you will see or hear reported some of the Israeli public or a size will think the Israeli government isn't going far enough or hard enough. There's all these competing tensions. So I suppose my question there is obviously how where do you think they are of what's happening in Gaza? And of course, you see these images of people going out and physically trying to block the humanitarian assistance going in. Um, I'm not a media expert, um, but, you know, it would seem, and, and I'm certainly not the first to point this out, that in the, to the extent to which the opening, the liberating, the democratization of media, that social media brought, uh, the, the, the algorithm has also happily channeled people further down their own rabbit holes. And so I think what you get is, in the Israeli mainstream media, first of all, let's just acknowledge there is a very active military censor. So that is more uh, looking at what images come out, what numbers come out. You know, the Israeli military casualties are at, at a number that I think Israeli society is dealing with. But I think what that also obscures, for instance, 
is there are a lot of horrendous injuries, life-changing injuries, because one of the things that people need to factor in is this isn't the British or American military in Iraq and Afghanistan with field hospitals. Israel is in a situation in Gaza where you're a very, very short helicopter evacuation from the top medical facilities. So in other words, a lot of people who would actually have, have, have not survived are surviving, not in a great way. So anyway, so there's, I use that as an example of the ex, of military censorship in Israel and the storyline that's coming out and it's a mobilized society and media is censored and self-censoring. In other words, stories that humanize ordinary Gazans, the things that most of us are seeing, they are not seeing. And those who are on social media are going down the rabbit hole more than anything else. So I think that um, I don't want to suggest that there you go, that explains everything. Because, of course, people, some do look elsewhere. So they certainly can look elsewhere. But I do think that this combination of people thinking only about uh, their own trauma, if you like, not wanting to be confronted by that other reality, but also not being confronted by it. I think it's a, a huge failure of the Israeli media and, 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 and social environment that, that that is not happening. And I say that for the following reason, because I think if you are not sufficiently aware of what is going on on the other side, you're not in a position to do correct decision-making or correct analysis of, of what's happening and what can go on. Now, I would add here that it's not an unusual situation in a in an asymmetric struggle and in an occupier occupied uh, kind of colonial setup where the colonized, the occupied, the oppressed need in their asymmetric situation to know the society, the mentality, the reality of that more powerful occupying party more and, and almost as the apartheid occupying party, you need not to know because heaven forbid you should begin to humanize what has become othered. Indeed, indeed. Um, and before we sort of go on to the government here, because we've talked about society, I do want us to finish on the thought uh, about the Palestinians inside Israel who have Israeli citizenship, um, because as you said, they're sitting here, they're in a society where, yes, they have citizenship, but they're always worried about their position in society. And, you know, the allies, their Jewish allies, as you said, haven't offered them the kind of support they've been looking for and, in fact, have maybe worried them. So I wonder if you can talk to us a little bit about what is the dynamic happening with, as you can tell, within Palestinians, within Israel, and what they're facing right now because of this Gaza operation. Yeah, and, and, and as well, I think, it, you know, we have to acknowledge that it's not a monolith. No society is a monolith. So there is a phenomenon. It is a phenomenon that has 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 continued to advance of um, the Israelization and de-Palestinianization of parts of that community, and that community says, "Look, you know, I'm not going to be nationally equal. I'm not going to be able to 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 succeed in this place, carrying forward my Palestinian identity proudly. But I can do okay in this society. I can even do very okay." If I keep my head below the parapet in the, and that's true, you know, we're, we're talking here in the UK as I mean, we, you know, we, 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 we're very familiar uh, with that in terms of, uh, in terms of minorities, in terms of minorities who are discriminated against the extent of the structural discrimination, I would suggest in Israel is very different when it's uh, defined as a Jewish state in that way and how that's carried out in practice. But the other trend, which I think is the, the clearly the majority trained in that society. Um, it's a chilling uh, environment at the moment. Now, we have to place that in a context where the Palestinian national movement at a certain point um, basically said, okay, the 48ers, that's a whole different story. 
especially when you when you made the strategic choice for partition. Um, but it, so that community, in many respects, feels doubly abandoned, abandoned by Palestinian national politics, which anyway, of course, is in a state of dreadful disrepair, but also abandoned on the Israeli side. And they, they, there's this constant tension. How much do we continue to operate within, for instance, the parliamentary rules of a system so stacked against us? But what we have especially seen, I think, uh, since October 7th, for several weeks, that's just changed a little, is that an inability to, to, to protest, an inability to articulate positions. Um, as I've said, the, this, this national security uh, police minister, Ben Kabir, uh, handing out weapons. So this is, and, and given the, the, the rhetoric, that the International Court of Justice has, has described as incitement to genocide in one of the provisional measures that it says needs to be taken. Um, I think many people understand that there are moments in, in, in a struggle where you keep your head down. Indeed. So now let's move towards the government itself. So at this time, you know, we have sort of you know, entering the fourth month. I don't know if there will be a ceasefire in, in the near future or not, but we are entering the fourth month uh, of the beginning of the uh, war on Gaza. Um, and we're no, it doesn't seem like we're any closer, for example, to ending the violence. There's also doesn't seem to be many, much development in terms of returning hostages other than the Paris talks, of course. Um, so what do you think at this time, Netanyahu, and his senior officials are thinking at this time. What is the strategy here? One of the hardest things sometimes for people to wrap their heads around is um, there's an assumption. Okay, Israel, pretty strong state, has its act together, very good at deploying its, uh, its tools of advocacy, PR, intimidation. So these guys are pretty strategic. And, and I think the, the response that acknowledges that sometimes there is a real lack of strategy, uh, that actually the, the arrogance and hubris feed into an inability to effectively strategize. People are like, wait, no, you're, you're not, you're describing some Arab states there, right? No, no, no. This is true of Israel, and I think part of the shock to the system is that this was not just a failure of intelligence. We've read the stories that, you know, this unit flagged up, sure. It's not just a failure that all these units have been diverted to the West Bank to protect settlers under this government. It's not just a failure of immediate response, and also the, the dramatic use of the Hannibal Doctrine of making sure uh, hostages weren't taken, even at the cost of, uh, of, of killing of one's own. It's also a failure of political understanding, imagination of the reality in which they live. Therefore, it's a deep failure uh, of strategy. So that's, I, th I think that's an important place to start and to acknowledge. The, the Israeli reaction is partly driven and I think significantly driven by the immediacy of um, the political dynamics. And there's a whole world of, of joy or pain is probably more accurate around uh, Netanyahu's own calculations, a man on trial uh, for corruption, a man whose legacy is now the greatest failure in Israeli history, desperately trying to claw that back and to survive. There's a dynamic around the military who have had the myth of invincibility shattered with very significant consequences going forward. So some of the dynamics are around that, a public baying for blood very often. Um, but then you take a step back and you say, history of course didn't begin on October 7th, certainly not for Palestinians living without rights being the history in terms of what were the assumptions that the different Israeli camps came into this with. And here's where you see some of it playing out. 
So I would not make light of the extent to which inside the Israeli government, inside also elements of the Israeli military and society, you have a, a camp and a hope and an intention that this crisis not go to waste in ways that drive out the Palestinian population, in ways that there's something that's interesting about the Israeli hard right. I think the Israeli hard right looks at it and says, are we going to accept Palestinian equality, even a real Palestinian state? Of course we're not. Do you really think you can get away with apartheid indefinitely? You're the ones who are fooling yourselves. If this is going to not end up with sharing or equality or a Palestinian victory, we have to act first. And, and, and the Israel Victory Project, if we could call it that, that's the main challenge to the Stay the Course. The Stay the Course Project is Bantustan management has worked for us. The Palestinian Authority is about to enter its fourth decade of existence. It manages security. We don't like it, but it does what's written on the tin. It's it's the Bantu stand. And they're saying, no, that's not going to work. We need to get, get rid of these people. They need to be physically removed from the expanse of greater Israel. And so I think that fault line is also in play. I don't think the government has relinquished what we know were options it was seriously promoting and considering early on vis-a-vis -vis, um, forcing the expulsion, again, after the Nakba, and we know why that Palestinian population in Gaza is, is refugees and descendants of refugees and live in refugee camps, to push a second mass displacement. So that is an important fault line um, on the Israeli side, and it feeds into the day-to-day decision-making. And then the other thing that uh, one has to think about as one looks at uh, high-level decision-making is how they are trying to respond to a frustration that I don't think this is going as they planned. Killing 26,000-plus civilian... 26,000-plus, the majority of those numbers, I think, are civilian. I think whatever um, militant, armed, resistance... Uh, Deaths are, are, are happening, uh, are mostly not in that figure. Having killed that many, killing 10,000 children, without having done this maximalist, unachievable thing of destroying Hamas, it, it broadcasts weakness, not strength. And I think, yeah, I'm not saying this is uh, that Hamas's fighting force hasn't been degraded at all, it has, but this has not been the, um, the Israeli military delivering on expectations. And that's before we even go into the regional situation, Hezbollah, a totally different proposition to Hamas, of course. So before we finish on this point, because another consideration, of course, and this is something the Israeli public do want, is the hostages returned. But there's this thing where, of course, they will say the hostages are any are a red line we want them back but a lot of israel's actions in gaza haven't really you know yielded hostages being returned and there's a part of me that wonders whether you know they have to say publicly we want the hostages back but privately they're not it's not their top goal um and there's also a part of me that wonders because as you've mentioned you've got sort of the hard right inside netanyahu's government particularly the religious hard right some of whom I suspect are not very, you know, sympathetic towards some of the people who were taken because, especially those at the Novo Festival, because, you know, they represent in many ways the opposition. Um, I wonder how that sort of plays out as part of the politics. It's, it's, a, it's a really uh, interesting and relevant point that, that you raise us, man. It, look, first of all, it's a real fault line in I think in Israeli society and even in the war cabinet a little bit. Um, it would be hard to look at uh, Israel's um, 
positioning behavior and conclude that for the highest level of decision makers in the government, the hostages are a priority. Okay. The greatest point of weakness for Netanyahu is the transparency of that, especially with the families. They have mobilized. I don't think you would have seen the initial pause and release over that eight, nine day period um, without the mobilization of families and the pressure they brought to bear. I don't think you'll see it again if that doesn't happen, which is why it's important for Netanyahu to at least be seen to be um, attempting in, in, a, in a more serious uh, negotiation. And I think, you know, if, if there's another pause on Netanyahu's terms, I think he's OK with that, of course. Um, and if there's not, and he can blame Hamas or the Qatari mediator who he's trying to undermine consistently, then that's, that's OK as well. Um, that's not OK for a significant section of Israeli society. And what you're seeing, and that's what you suggested, is this basically breaks down along the same lines as the polarization in Israeli society prior to October 7th broke down when one was, of course, several months into weekly protests against the so-called um, anti-democratic judicial overhaul. Only tangentially did the, the biggest um, failure challenge to Israeli democracy come up, which is, of course, treatment of Palestinians and occupation. It was getting a little more traction, perhaps. But anyway, that polarization is still there in Israeli society. I think Netanyahu knows if and when this ends, the demonstrations will return in a vengeance. Um, and as you said, and, 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 and it's a fascinating thing uh, and a quite tragic thing for the, for the families who, well, let's be clear, they are going through hell. Uh, and I've spoken to a number of the families and, and I think for many of them, it took time to realize that going to the UK or elsewhere um, was, was not what was going to shift the dynamics. It, it was challenging their, their own government. Not all of them have reached that conclusion. I think many of them have. These come from a cohort of Israeli society where the, the Venn diagram, shaded area, overlap between the governing coalition and these people is very thin indeed. So government ministers are not going out in their local neighborhoods, are not going to their synagogue on the weekend. They're not, you know, in their social milieu, seeing those families could say come from a very different milieu in Israeli society. So, yeah, and also I think it's interesting, as we were saying that, that I think Joe Biden, US President Joe Biden actually met with the hostages families before Netanyahu did. <laughs> so there's a little bit of uh, that. But uh, I sort of want to combine two questions to finish on. Um, first of all, um, those two questions are going to be, how do you think this war overall has impacted Israel's standing in the world? And what do you think will be, what do you think will be at the end of all of this when the war is over? What do you think the dynamic is going to be? What's left for us, for Israel, for Palestinians and for the region? The easy one. Um, yes. So we're, we're, we're going through the night. Um, Israel has, I think, taken a hit in its international equities and standing from which I'm not sure it can recover actually. Now in many respects it's tragic in virtually every respect it's tragic that this had to happen in order for that to be the case. So you know, first of all let's just look at this and I do want to start less on the reputation and just make one point i i and because this is important you know for me the work is in it, it should be in, in diplomacy in public opinion in in mobilization in messaging but what's really driving things at the moment is the balance of forces on the ground on the battlefield and here may actually be the area where israel's vulnerabilities have been most exposed i'm just gonna put that out there uh, not only um, in the immediate Palestinian environs, but regionally, I think, especially. 
uh, the fact that Hezbollah hasn't been brought into this, but what the Houthis have, have, have done in terms of disruption. Okay. But when we pull back from that, so let's, let's look at Israel's legal standing, what South Africa achieved at the International Court of Justice. There has been, uh, as one would expect, a very concerted effort to spin this as not only uh, the, 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 the attacks on South Africa, but also, oh, look, what a victory, no genocide, nothing to see here, no immediate ceasefire. The International Court of Justice, the highest legal body in the world, is going forward to rule on genocide because they have already ruled by a majority of 15 to 2 on most things, on some things, the, even the Israeli judge um, joined the, the overwhelming majority, that there is a plausible case to be answered and that irreparable harm and prejudice is being committed and therefore provisional measures, which essentially amount to the end of the Israeli military operation, need to be taken. Very significant. The votes at the UN General Assembly, often America barely managing to muster double figures uh, at the General Assembly, having to deploy uh, its veto in the UN Security Council, the mobilization of the international South, the public mobilization in so many spaces around the world, including in the West, the symbol that Palestine, those colors, the watermelon, has become the way the way it's almost become a stand-in for uh, a way of people of, of expressing the injustice they feel in, war, in elements of their own life. The songs that have punched through. So th there's, a, there's a cultural, you know what, coolness to it, which I don't think is going to be put back in the box. Now, I, I, here I want to pause and take a step back because that doesn't deliver tomorrow an end to what's going on in Gaza or the week after uh, an end to this apartheid reality which has been created. We should not underestimate the significant residual power. But I'm using the word residual because I think there is a shifting landscape. The tectonic plates have moved. But there is significant power still at the disposal of Israel, still at the disposal of those who have guaranteed its impunity until now. That's the terrain on which uh, this will now play out. But it plays out, I would argue, in a different balance with a different set of equities than were the case previously. And one example, this International Court of Justice case. At the beginning, I think the Israelis felt they could dismiss it. The, people may remember, and people may not know him anyway, and why would you? He's, a, he's a, almost a comically caricature uh, human. Uh, at, at Dershowitz, Alan Dershowitz, there was talk that he was going to be the lawyer that would represent Israel at the International Court of Justice. And at, the, at first, Israel said, don't need to take it seriously. We've called it a blood libel. We've used the word. Now everyone run away because that closes down conversation. It's, it's anti-Semitism. OK, we're done. Wait, what do you mean it's going forward? And then what the hell do you mean? 15 to 2. 15 to 2, 16 to 1 on some occasions. So the we can just close things down is dumb. So the, the balance looks different here. Like I said, let's not get carried away with ourselves. though. And that takes me to the, 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 the second point that you raised, Usman, which is, so where, where does this... You know, what, what, what kind of a, a Middle East are we looking at? Um, the effect of all of this, I think, first of all, it will depend on where this does end. Now, 
the attempt to displace Palestinians may well continue after the guns fall silent. So I think we have to also be cognizant that you could have a situation in which this military assault stops, but the situation is so desperate, the limitations that Israel imposes on bringing stuff in, that Israel has already positioned itself on the Egyptian border. And maybe there will still be, post-war actually, a greater ability to say, look, the only place you're going to be able to get the, the dire assistance you need is on that side of the border. So there are things to do with what this looks like at the end and things that need to be prevented, including how far, you know, we haven't talked about the escalation in the West Bank. Let's not ignore that for many of those in power in Israel, Gaza was already siloed off from the rest of the Palestinian expanse. The real challenge was how do you depopulate Judea and Samaria of Palestinians, the West Bank. And so there's been huge arrests, assaults, and also just destruction of infrastructure there. So we have to look at where, where this ends physically on the ground. But if we zoom out again to, to, to where are the dynamics, I think we are now in a moment that will only become more pertinent, more focused. We're in a moment which is trying to define pol the political contours of the morning after. And I think there is a, an American, Western, the UK seems to have a plan, um, effort. The goal here is to bring as many regional states into this plan, the normalized states, those who, who established relations with Israel as part of the marginalization of the Palestinians, those who gave a huge impetus to Israeli impunity and extremism. Um, to try and put a plan together which pushes things back into the status quo ante of a frozen peace process, which allows Israel to manage the occupation and to entrench its apartheid. And to do that, a core feature of that means you need to have the Palestinian Bantu stand still functioning. So you need the Palestinian Authority to be part of that. So that's the refreezing effort, just as the tectonic plates are shifting. And perhaps you create a different kind of Bantu stand governance in Gaza. And I think the dispute between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu right now is, is quite a narrow one, actually. And it's a dispute over, hey, guy, can we just call this a political horizon? Can we call this a Palestinian state? Now, Netanyahu at one stage in 2009 and another fleeting moment said, you know what? What I'm telling you is this is not a state. It's a Bantu stand. And the Americans said, what do you care if we call it a state? And we said, OK, let's call it a state. Cis guy, trans guy, Boputatswana, the, the, those homelands, they had their flags. They went around the world saying, hey, we're real states. Um, however, right now, because of his political coalition, Netanyahu is resistant to the labeling. The question is, on the Palestinian side, and this is going to be crucial, is there a counter push not to be driven down that track? Is there a counter push from other forces or do we get refrozen? I think a sustainable refreezing will be very hard to achieve under these circumstances. But the shift will not self propel. It will have to be propelled by those forces that have come to the fore, those forces on the Palestinian side, in civil society, in the global South, who are challenging the impunity.
amongst progressive Jews who have been challenging that. So this is the this is what is playing out. Daniel Levy, thank you for talking to us in my conversations. Thank you, Osman. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in. If you've missed this one or would like to catch up with previous ones, you can go to our website. But please do tune in next time for more Memo Conversations. This was Middle East Monitor Conversations, brought to you by the Middle East Monitor in London.